charge of the program, but um, I have been in the program almost 36 years. So um, I've been a professor and medical illustrator uh, uh, there, and uh, I teach in the graduate program, which is a two-year program in medical and biological illustration. And uh, many of my uh, students are here this evening, ready to share their work and talk with you about their paths to the profession and art that they like and what they're creating. And we wanted this to be a conversation rather than a presentation. So please feel free to ask questions uh, during or after each student who presents. And so we'll start out with Courtney. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having us, first of all. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen uh, so I can show you the piece that I was wanting to talk about in particular. So this is one of my personal favorite pieces that I worked on during my first year. I'm currently a second year student at Hopkins. And this is about talking about your C1 or your atlas vertebrae and a novel variation of it that was discovered in a case study. And this case study was featuring a 16 year old who, if you can believe it, had a stroke. So I'd like to get into how that was kind of discovered. So in our vertebrae, um, we have like these little shelves underneath this little flat surface called the articular surface. And they typically are kind of open. So, oh, it's typically kind of open, like if I had like this little like climbing clip here, and here's the vertebral artery that would kind of just like sit underneath it. So if you have the presence of the ponticuli, it's actually going to be this little closed part. And so this way you have like this little channel actually that the um, vertebral artery is passing through. And in particular, if you have the dorsal variation, which is the very back of the posterior formation, in a lot of cases, your vertebral artery can get snagged if you move your neck in a, a really bad way, and that can cause you to have a stroke. And in this case, and this 16 year old patient, um, he had a whole channel. So a whole channel that was like literally formed around his vertebral artery. And that led to what's called a watershed stroke and watershed meaning that it's basically a cutoff of circulation that is happening away from the site where the actual like damage had occurred. So in this case, it was a totally novel thing that was discovered in the 16 year old patient. I feel so bad for this patient to be so young and have this very rare uh, kind of formation have been, been involved. So I worked with a Hopkins neuroradiologist who was on this case and this poster was designed for presentation for his clinical discussions that he had with his colleague. And Courtney, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, so I graduated from the University of Oklahoma in Stillwater, um, Oklahoma State University, excuse me, in Stillwater. Um, I have a physiology degree before I came to Hopkins, so I had a little bit deviated from like the specificity of like maybe focusing primarily on art. I think a lot of us come from very diverse backgrounds here. Uh, one of my biggest interests is trying to further uh, patient education, and I got really interested in trying to be involved in professional um, or more expert-oriented communication with my time working with a lot of experts here at Hopkins. It's, it's really fascinating to be able to facilitate that communication between experts and getting to kind of almost be somewhat on their level of understanding certain uh, topics that they talk about. So, yeah. Uh, any questions for Courtney? Can you tell us the media that you create, you use to create this artwork? Yeah, so I the the rendered form that you see here was created in Adobe Photoshop, and uh, so I know for some people you think oh Photoshop is just for like you know messing around with pictures and everything, but you can be used it to a lot of like other painting purposes. Um, I did some I actually used this other 3D modeling co program called ZBrush. I was able to pull what's called the DICOM data or the actual like radiological data that's shown in 3D to get a, like an actual direct reference of what this patient's vertebrae looked like. So I, used, so I was able to combine a reference from a modeling program called ZBrush, and then I rendered it out in Photoshop. Well, if there are no other questions for Courtney, we'll move on to Ji Young. Thank you for your time. Yay, Courtney. All right. Um... Hi, I'm, can you guys see my screen? I'm gonna get the camera. Um, so my project was on the extraocular muscles of the eye and it explains each of their functions. 
and it was made for an audience of medical students. And so when they're learning about the muscles of the eye, most, most illustrations show them from a view that covers at least two of the muscles. And so I um, made sure to illustrate them in an oblique angle so that they're visible. And I also made the eye all translucent so you could see the medial rectus muscle. Um, and so on the left side, I show the gross anatomy of the muscles and the inset below shows the origin of each muscle um, back to the optic nerve and explains the angle of the rotation. And then on the right side, you'll see um, below like which muscle causes which kind of movement of the eye. Um, and for the medium, I use Adobe Photoshop. And for the skull reference, I use a CT scan to get um, data for that. And then I also just used um, reference images from other anatomical plates to get um, references from the muscles and the eyeball itself. I'd like to share and, with the yeah, audience like, that uh, the first year graduate students take the uh, medical school anatomy course with the med students. And they do very, very well year after year. Any questions for Ji Young? We want to have a conversation. If there's anything <laughs> on your mind about the, you know, the image or something related, we'd we'd love to discuss it with you. Oh, um, and and you can raise your. I mean, I can't see the hands, but you can um, just use the chat box and say you have a question, and we'll we then you can unmute or just feel like you can unmute right now and and come on in. Don't don't feel shy. Yeah, I think that would be easiest uh, just to unmute and 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 if you have to, butt right in. Hey, well, I have a question. Oh, oh, go ahead. What, why you choose okay. this topic? This was like over a year ago. I don't remember. <laughs> um, <laughs> my content expert was Dr. Um, Cook, and I was I really liked her lectures during anatomy because. Um, so our content experts for these topics, for these um, projects, are the anatomy professors in the, med in the School of Medicine. And so I remember I liked hearing her lectures, and um, we also have meetings with them to make sure that what we're creating is anatomically correct, and I really enjoyed working with her. Um, I don't remember the other options for the projects, but yeah. So usually with these oh, projects, the students are uh, charged with having a main explanatory image and then to provide uh, any number of insets to further tell the story. And they're writing the narrative and providing all the uh, labels and are guiding you know, the, the viewer through this educational process. How much editorial or how much input do the content um, uh, mentors or the, the 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 folks that you're trying to create something for have within the process and how much do they get to do it edits and makes changes or ask you to do that uh it really depends on the content expert we work with um i think on average the amount of input they give is um to make sure that it's anatomically correct and that it conveys the message of trying to teach the audience but in terms of you know when it comes to style um like color scheme we keep we're the ones that keep that in mind and we're taught by our professors to keep things like color blindness and um just contrast in mind for color schemes so to make it accessible for a big a wide audience and this is for courtney as well i mean how much did you know about this part, these parts of the body before you get into it. So you have to learn everything from the from the bottom up. Yeah, um, um, pretty much. We had just taken anatomy um, before coming back to this. We we take anatomy and we come back to the department and start on projects. Courtney, this was a, was this the first project after anatomy? The first project after anatomy. Um, I think was it, it? I think it was like was it? Didn't we start like neuro somewhat soon after that as well? Because at that point we had yeah. more anatomy background. Um, yeah, I don't think yeah. during anatomy we didn't go into super. Um, we didn't go super detailed into the extraocular muscle. So we always do have to do some research to get to kind of freshen our memory. Yeah. Um, Laura's, has, 
I was, I was going to say some of the content experts that we work with for these projects also provide us literature or other examples they used to teach. So we get more kind of specialized knowledge about that particular topic. So we always have to come back and refresh our, our knowledge from time to time on things. And can you tell us how sure. long the course is? How many, how many weeks? Courtney or, or Gia? <laughs> is it about uh, 10 weeks? 10 I think weeks it's long? Like I think it's more than that. Like, I'm only using like that as, a, as an example of how much yeah, information. Yeah, like 10, 10, 11 weeks. But we have also, we, we have other courses going on. So in terms okay. of work days, it's not 10 full weeks of only working on this. Well, it is eight to two every day for, you know, five weeks. I mean, for uh, five uh, days a week. And um, uh, that's a lot of... Uh, dissection and learning the anatomy, all the origins, insertions, and pathways uh, in, throughout the entire body. Hey, Tim, we have some questions in the chat box. Doors asked, do you also try to make an animation that would be great for illustrating extraocular muscle movements? Wait. So we, so if you go on YouTube, there are a few animations of, there are 3D animations that are, um, they use um, extraocular muscles that they modeled in programs like ZBrush. Um, I was actually thinking of doing an animation, so just like on my in my spare time. So, but we know we're not required. Um, and who, how, where will your illustrations be used? Um, they will be they're used for the medical students in anatomy. So if they if the content expert wants to use it, then that that's the audience that would see it. Um, we also put them in our portfolios on our website, so um, they might be, if people ask us for permission to use them, then we kind of, we go over that with copyright. Uh, what are the prerequisites Liz, for the program? That's kind of a general question. What, what, are, what are the prerequisites, Tim? How do you get into this program? Well, well let's G, G. Young or Courtney tell about how they got into the program. Um, I was a pre-med major and all through college, I had plans for going to medical school and then I learned about medical illustration and I changed paths. But basically for this program, you have all the prerequisites of medical school. Um, you don't have to take things like organic chemistry, but I had to anyway for my major. Um, so you have to have a scientific background. Um, so you just have to take the make sure you have a transcript of those science courses. And then in terms of art courses, you don't have to take any. You just have to have a portfolio that meets their requirements. And Courtney, tell us about the requirements of the portfolio. Oh, for the admission yes. requirements? Um, from what I can remember off the top of my head, we focus a lot on making sure we have the fundamentals. So we don't require any, we don't actually discourage um, any examples of medical or anatomical or most scientific art just to make sure that students grasp the fundamentals. So we have a lot of emphasis on figure drawing. Um, we have also like other things about compositions like focus on still lights, for example, um, really paying attention to things about the use of color, light on form. It's really just a demonstration of the fundamentals and that again, I, I like Ji Young, I primarily came from like a science background with a science degree. I was also planning to go to med school at some point, but um, it's just making sure that we have um, the tools equipped for us to, to hit the ground running once we start the program and then we pick up more specific and scientific and medical knowledge and techniques from there. All right, so let's move on to Nicole, if she's here. Tim, I think there's other questions later when we have time. So they're asking about coming from an art background would need to take some science courses. That is correct. There are certain science requirements for our program. And um, that one of them would be molecular uh, uh, biology, uh, uh, cell biology, uh, embryology, genetics, something like that, along with anatomy and physiology with uh, mammalian dissection prior to coming into the program. But you know, we we encourage as many science courses as 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 possible. All right, is Nicole here? I wonder. No, she's on. I don't okay. Think she's How about Gilbert? You're up, Gilbert.
Hello, everyone. My name is Gilbert, and I'm a second year student at Hopkins. I'm from Taiwan. And so uh, when I was in undergrad, I studied in biotechnology. And at that time, I just worked in the lab, and then I draw a lot for my professor for publication. And then one day, my professor said, oh, you should look it up. Maybe somebody did that for a career. And then I look it up. I found this program. I think it's really great, so I applied it. And this piece is, uh, so I, I did this piece in editorial illustration class. It's illustration or design, I don't remember. But so we select a research article and make a journal cover for it. And so for this one, I choose that the light exposure during sleep impairs cardiometabolic function, which means, you know, at night, even though your eyes is closed, the eyelid cannot uh, block out all the light. So your brain still sensing the light. And then your heart will pump, still pump really fast because they thought, oh, it's still, you know, on the daytime. So I just want to remind people like uh, at night, be sure you close your blind fully. Yeah. And I use the, so this is the heart. And the facial expression is like showing that, you know, at night you just couldn't fall asleep and then you just so disappear. Yeah. So in this course, we give the students a lot of latitude to do storytelling, creative storytelling, and kind of break out of the mold of, of realism, perhaps understanding who your audience is, trying to come up with a novel and creative solution to, uh, to telling the story behind the science. And, and I how, was, I'll, I'll just quickly say that the professional journals have become a lot more uh, uh, easy to work with from the standpoint of having a broader view of art that they'll put on their covers. And so it's just a pleasant opportunity for the uh, students uh, to create artwork that's uh, a lot more creative and, and clever. And how I, how I create this piece, I uh, just use pencil and uh, paper to sketch out the, the rough sketch. And then I scan it into uh, Illustrator to clean up my lines. And then I use uh, Photoshop to do the color and the design. Any other questions for Gilbert? Yeah, there's a lot of discussion going on in the chat box. Okay, I'm trying to keep up with that as well. Let's see. Once once students graduate, what are the typical jobs? Um, is it mostly freelance or their salary positions? We encourage them to uh, take on salaried positions. Freelance can be very uh, difficult and uh, uh, not the best option coming right out of school by taking a uh, salaried job and working with a perhaps a, an animation company or a journal or some other uh, concern like that, that they'll get more business experience and uh, production experience uh, for their portfolio and, and their education moving forward. And then they've just been talking about, you know, how long it was taking to make each of the pieces and uh yeah so there's just a good conversation going on i would say making a piece it really depends on the topic some topic you will spend more time on research understand the anatomy understand the article but some projects are more straightforward so you can focus more on the design the visual thing you want to put in so it really depends All right, if we have no more questions for Gilbert, let's uh, hear from Ann. Anna. All right, hi everyone. My name is Ann, and uh, today I'm going to share my um, interactive project. Uh, there's just a heads up, there's going to be some, a little bit of music and sound effects. Okay. So for this project, um, we got to scoped. Um, we got to choose a um, 
a body part and we got to scope it digitally. So the mm -hmm. program that we used is ZBrush. So I created this um, in ZBrush, um, scoping the bone and then the muscle. And then we brought it into Udity to create a didactic um, WebGL module. And so, oh, I Wait, hold on. Uh, there. Um, so here, um, I have the anatomy part where you can click around, um, learn about each part of the rotator cuff. So the muscle, the bone. And then I also have a second part where it shows um, the action that the muscle does. And you can turn the model around and zoom in if needed. So each of these is a different um, muscle action. And the muscles that are performing the action are highlighted. And then lastly, um, I also included a quiz to sort of test the knowledge. And yeah, and then it does provide feedback um, if you get it wrong, it'll tell you and you also lose a life and there's also a scoring system. And uh, yeah, if you don't know what button does what, uh, there's also a question mark right here that show you. And yep, so that's my project. I'll turn out the sound. <laughs> Yeah, so my thought process behind the little music was that I just wanted to create a little um, ambience atmosphere for learning and some sound effect for feedback. You know, when you click on something, you know that you click on something because you hear that. So, yeah. I love this, and I think this would be great to show people, the doctor showing people in the doctor's office. <laughs> when they're trying to explain what's going on and what your problem is this I, this really shows it i love it thank you any other comments rachel right. says uh, in the classes do you ever discuss the impact that this type of work can have on broadening access to medical education for example, some people may not have adequate access to dissection labs, so perhaps these kinds of interactive illustrations could help with education and accessibility. Sorry, can you repeat the question? It was cutting out a little bit. Is it's it in the chat box. If you want to pull up the chat box, it's the last um, comment by Rachel. It's about <clears throat> the impact that your cut that your work like this can have in broadening access to medical education. Yeah, um, actually we do talk a lot about accessibility in um, our program. Um, our professor, Jeff, he, he gave us um, a presentation about how to make our work more accessible. You know, sometimes it has to do with, oh, um, if someone, we, we make sure to, if, if, a, if an artwork has some sort of writing, we do make sure that it is at an adequate level of reading that is accessible to most people. And also, for example, in animations, um, we might want to include captions for people who might not be able to hear well or um, vice versa. If someone can't see, then we would have um, audio description as well. So we do um, really prioritize accessibility in our work. And all of the work that's created always has a either a specific audience or a broad audience for teaching purposes. So this would make for a wonderful patient ed piece. Are there are these are these um, also used I guess in documentaries or different things on uh, they'll take and pull this out and, and insert this into a, into a video. Anna, <laughs> anybody? 
yeah, all of our work is accessible and, and is many times created for multiple platforms and audiences. So it's a matter of what are the objectives, who is the audience, what is the teaching moment, and uh, the students all get that clear and create artwork accordingly. All right, let's move on to Manal. Hi everyone, um, I'm a first year grad student here at Hopkins. Um, I'm a radiologist from Taiwan and uh, this is the piece I would like to share with you all. This is an interesting collaboration between our department and the National Aquarium here in Baltimore. Um, the targeted audience are vets who are more familiar with managing domestic pets like cats and dogs. Um, this piece is to be distributed whenever the aquarium receives an emerging consultation from vets outside the institution. And so it mainly talks about differences of emergent animal management between a distressed tuto sloth and domestic animals. Yeah, so um, we'll come to any comments. Can you tell us about how this course starts out and what your opportunities are in, in the course? Yeah, this was a very interesting course. It was about, uh, the duration was about, I remember, five to six weeks. So we first visited the aquarium and they sort of matched us up to a content expert who works at the aquarium. And they propose like um, topics they're interested in um, having an illustration made. Um, so after we choose the topic, we started collaboration with them and for me, it's a little bit different for every project, but for me with this project, we basically visit the aquarium, the slot, um, at least once a week and just to observe and see how the animals behave and react in their environment they created over there. So it was kind of interesting. And also because I'm working on like a more, more uh, veterinarian piece. So I also get to work with their wildlife vet um, who takes me around to see their ward, to see their surgical gallery and see how they work and what devices they use. That's um, how I made like the little uh, intubation uh, devices or the catheters here and the illustration and they're made in um, 3D modeling softwares and then combined with Photoshop later on. So this course has been part of our program since 1995. And uh, I've been in charge of this program. Jeff Day also on the faculty has come on to assist. And the variety of topics are just amazing from uh, taking blood samples from sharks, uh, behavior in dolphins, uh, why turtles bask, all kinds of different kinds of uh, uh, projects that will either end up in publication or on display in the aquarium. I am so jealous that you got to play with sloths. <laughs> <laughs> it's slow work, somebody has to do it. Any other comments? We might see another aquarium piece in this this evening. I'm not sure what's what's up to bat, but uh, thank you, Manal. Uh, Tanya. Manal, I, I have one more question. You said that they they you made the 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 pieces and with the 3D printer and then incorporated them into the artwork. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Oh, just the devices. I made them in 3D softwares, like totally digitally. I didn't print them out. And then when I made the assets and turned it to an angle that I liked, I uh, pasted them onto uh, my the rest of my illustration and tried to make them look in sync. There's, there's a lot of 3D modeling that's come into our program and it's been very useful in surgery and in procedures like this where the students actually sculpt the instruments uh, or apparatus or whatever is necessary, then as Manal has explained, rotates it in the view, the proper view for orientation. And then it's pasted in, painted, you know, elaborated on and, uh, you know, uh, brought into the same kind of uh, media look as the rest of the drawing and painting. All 
All right, so we have Tanya. Yay. Okay. Yeah. Hi, guys. Um, everything's been so wonderful so far. Great, great presentations, everybody. Um, my name's Tanya, and I'm going to show you a piece of mine, which at this point kind of feels like a throwback. But um, so this is, can everybody see my screen? Okay, cool. So this is a piece that we did for our Raster Tone Illustration class. It was one of the first courses that we took upon entering the program. I'm a first year, by the way. Um, and so this was one of like the first challenges that we underwent where we had to um, find a specimen and do some research on said specimen and then illustrate that specimen um, and also include a couple of interesting insets to explain like the information that we wanted to talk about with, with that specimen. And I decided to talk about the striped bark scorpion, um, partially because it was the only one I could find online and I got a couple of those off of Etsy. Um, and I still have them. They're named Cookie and Milk. Um, they're they're <laughs> dead specimens. <laughs> they're dead specimens. So they're like in these little preserved jars. Um, but yeah, I decided to illustrate Cookie. And I thought one particular fe feature that was interesting about these scorpions is that their tails could actually um, curl over and lay flat to the surface that they're on in order for them to kind of crawl under surfaces or even hide. And I thought that was both terrifying and very interesting. So I really wanted to illustrate that. Um, so yeah, it was a fun class. First challenge that we undertook as first years in the program. Any questions? <laughs> Why did you decide to go in black and white? Yeah, so for this first class, uh, that was one of the requirements is that this would just be a straight up tone illustration where we are just exploring values and ranges of values. Um, and so we weren't necessarily doing anything in color just yet. Um, we ended up doing a lot more color pieces late, late, later on, but this was the uh, first piece where they wanted us to do it in black and white. Yeah. So this is sort of a, a um... A, a path along which the students travel introduced to a variety of media with kind of a set goal in mind. So this is, you know, uh, a tone that will then lead to full color in other projects, but looking at light on form and atmosphere and detail, uh, foreground, background, that sort of thing. And this one was the first one that they were doing a real storytelling where they were given or they chose a topic and had to research it and then tell some uh, story around whatever the uh, appropriate parts or structures or apparatus uh, about each of the uh, organisms. Mm -hmm. yep. Pam asked if this is also done in Photoshop. Yes, so this was a combination of uh, traditional and Photoshop digital media. So we did the initial sketches um, and drawings in pencil. So uh, all of this all of the line work and everything like that was done in pencil and then after plenty of revisions because i personally had a tough time drawing cookies legs um after plenty of revisions we scanned them in put them into photoshop cleaned up those scans and then we essentially like drew the painted over them um and so the point of that as well was for us to kind of really uh value like line work in our art and some of, kind of throwback to some of the traditional media that we are used to using and to learn how to incorporate that seamlessly into the digital world that we live in now using like Photoshop and things like that. So it was a really fun project, yeah. Other than Photoshop and there, there was one other program that you that was mentioned a couple of times, I can't remember what it was. <laughs> what are the, uh, some of the other software that's being used? Yeah. Um, so besides all of, we use everything within like the Adobe realm, Photoshop, Adobe Illustrator. Um, we use After Effects for processing like animations and things like that. In terms of 3D media, uh, currently we're deep in the C4D, uh, it's Cinema 4D. It's uh, from Maxon, this company that does a lot of like 3D software. I think earlier Courtney might've mentioned ZBrush is another, um, and I think ZBrush might have been what Anne used to create um, some of the assets for her project as well. Um, and so that's really good for like digital sculpting of certain assets. So like the muscles that she did were digitally sculpted. Um, and so 
yeah, what am, what else am I missing? <laughs> Hopefully nothing else. Well, you're using animation software and Unity and, and 2D and 3D uh, assets and creating and modeling in that fashion. Yes, you, you, I think you pretty well covered all of them. Okay, cool. <laughs> I was gonna say, I haven't gotten to Unity yet, so probably missed it. That's coming. <laughs> cool. Tim, is everybody in the program not from Maryland? Is it, I mean, it seems like you pull internationally and from all over the United States. That's correct. We uh, we get about 300 inquiries a year. We receive almost 70 portfolios uh, by mid January. Then we uh, go through all of the portfolios. We have to, we look at their as an admissions committee. We look at their academics and their their all, all their coursework and any kinds of outside interests and certainly their art and their science grades. And then 20 are invited for an interview, and we end up with a class of seven. Seven special people. <laughs> yeah. Is there, do all of the students, I mean, it seems like it's so select, do they stay, is there a, a, a fraternity of sorts that they all stay together and are, are connected throughout, I mean, year after year? Uh, yes, there is the Association of Medical Illustrators, and our students are student members. And then at the end of their uh, graduate, uh, graduate year, second graduate year, many of them or all of them take uh, the certified medical illustrator, uh, what, what would you call it, CMI, uh, certified medical illustrator, a test that is knowledge-based and illustration-based. And um, then our association probably has 800 to 900 members worldwide, mostly in, in North America. And uh, yes, we're about ready to go to one of our meetings uh, this summer. They're, they have annual meetings. We did just come back from an exchange with uh, our students uh, that went down to Augusta to another program. And we exchanged with that program uh, back and forth every year. So the Augusta, Georgia students will come see us next year. All right, do we have Emily tonight? Yeah, hi, I'm Emily. Um, I'll be sharing my interactive as well. Um, let's see. Okay, and um, this piece uh, is done based on, uh, we, we actually have another program in our department, uh, the Clinical Anaplastology Program, uh, which is also a master's degree. Um, and so that's creating like uh, prosthetics, like um, an eye prosthetic, uh, which I'm showing here with this patient. Uh, so I decided to create an interactive showing uh, sort of to a patient audience, um, the process of how uh, anaplastologist creates um, an eye prosthetic. So I'll show that real quick. Um, so I kind of have this word story here. Uh, talking about years ago, I lost my eye to cancer, um, uh, which is a common reason for needing an eye prosthetic. When I go out, people always stare at me, a common reason for wanting a prosthetic, um, want to feel more confident. Uh, and so you get a list of actions to perform to learn what the anaplastologist does. And you play this game sort of uh, as the anaplastologist here that I'm moving around. Uh, and so I can go pick up the scanner and we would go scan the patient's face to get a model that we could then bring into the computer and prepare uh, the um, prosthetic. And then we would 3D print a mold for the model. Uh, and then we would cast that in silicone here. Uh, and then we create the prosthetic for the patient. So that's um, the interactive that I created, but I could also um, talk a little more about the anaplastology program, I guess, uh, if there are questions about that. Well, please tell us a little bit about that, if you will, please. Okay, uh, I only know a little bit. I mean, I'm not in that program, uh, but Nicole, the student uh, that was not here earlier, she is in that program. Um, she's uh, pursuing her master's, um, and I think, does she graduate this year, Tim? Yes, she does. 
and we'll be taking on some new students. So that's a, a pretty new degree for our, um, for, uh, our department, which we're excited about. Um, and she creates uh, digital prosthetics. So like for fingers, uh, missing fingers, she creates eye prosthetics, um, uh, facial, like partial facial prosthetics, ears, really a variety of different things um, that would basically replace um, uh, missing anatomy. Like if a person had, had lost an eye or had a malformed ear, um, or had lost fingers in some kind of an accident, she could replace these with like highly detailed and realistic um, prosthetics um, that were painted to be very realistic uh, to allow patients to um, really fit in well. And I think some of the prosthetics, like some of the facial prosthetics can even assist with like breathing and um, speaking, so. Any more questions for Emily? All right, we'll move to Grace. Okay, hi everybody. Good to see you all. Um, so this is really a lot like Tanya's project because we were both in the same class together, but um, just to start off where she uh, left off, um, I did my tone project about different behaviors that isopods do um, because they're just so cute and magical, of course. I hope you feel the same. Um, so what we had to do is we had to get the specimen in our hands to observe uh, so that we could draw. And so I decided to get some live roly polies and they came in a box and with a lot of like, uh, like packing peanuts and stuff. And then inside I had my little tiny jar of roly polies um, <laughs> that I loved and cared for and sometimes put under a dissection microscope. So sorry to those roly polies. Um, it, it was really fun to get to observe their behaviors uh, in real life that I read about in journal articles. I decided to go over three different behaviors in particular that they use to help them survive. Uh, so one in the top right, you'll see aggregation. So all the roly polies huddle up together so that they don't dry out as quickly. That's their like main threat, um, you know, other than everything eating them, right? Uh, and then we have that turn alternation tactic. So uh, roly polies will turn in a series of right, then left, then right, then left. So they can eventually just go straight. Uh, it helps them like get through obstacles or like unfamiliar locations. And then finally, what armadillidae and vulgari is so famous for, the conglobation behavior. Um, so I wanted to show exactly how uh, these roly polies roll up into a ball and how those different plates on their back might uh, go past one another and contract and move where their legs go. Um, and of course, that helps protect them from predators and uh, keeps them from drying out as well. Uh, so yeah, this was super fun. Uh, all pencil sketches that we scanned in. And then I did a lot of the shading in Photoshop and the text and graphic elements in Adobe Illustrator. So yeah, I'm open to any questions. Just happy to share with you. Did any of your pill bugs have names? <laughs> um, <laughs> they would have a name for like a day. It was really hard to tell them apart. There was like 20 of them. <laughs> I call them doodle bugs, uh, Tim, not, mm -hmm. not pill, uh, pill bugs. They, I guess it's a regional thing. I grew up in Louisiana, so they were doodle bugs to me. Yeah, Grace has those mentioned in her uh, narrative. Yeah. yeah, they have a ton of different names depending on where you're from. It's like super crazy. I had no idea until one day I was saying like, oh, really pulley. And like someone that I was talking to was like, what is that? Uh, that's really interesting. So again, I, I mean, Gilbert mentioned it, in, it when, when he was talking that um, somebody kind of turned him on to this as, a, as an option because he was drawing in, his, in, his, uh, in the lab. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to know how, how the other um, students kind of, uh, did they know that this was an option in terms of, uh, of uh, study and profession and how did they learn about it? Mm -hmm. 
Um, okay. I can say for sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go oh, ahead. sorry. I can say for myself really quickly. Um, I learned about it on accident in high school because um, my biology teacher showed a documentary about like I don't know if you know like Australopithecus, like Lucy, one of those like proto like the humans before humans kind of thing. And um, they show this documentary about how okay we found all these bones and then we have to piece everything together. And they had some scientific illustrators there to show what that skeleton would have looked like uh, if it were all intact. And I thought that was the coolest thing in the whole world. And then my biology teacher was like, hey, come here, let me tell you about scientific illustration. You should like do that. And I said, yeah, okay, I'll do that. And then, uh, yeah, then I did it. So <laughs> um, it was just like serendipitous, I guess. Yeah. All right, thank you. We'll go to Chloe. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Let me share my screen. Uh, so I'll be talking about the piece that I did in collaboration with the Baltimore National Aquarium and the Masonville Cove uh, Wildlife, uh, Urban Wildlife Refuge. Uh, so Masonville Cove is located in southwest Baltimore. It's a formerly industrial area that's being rehabilitated. Uh, and in 2019, the site had a pair of nesting bald eagles who built their nest um, at their site. And they're the first known pair of nesting bald eagles in Baltimore City. So that was a very big success for Masonville Cove. Uh, and as a result of that, portions of um, the area are closed off to the public uh, so that the eagles uh, are not disturbed by the people who visit that area. Uh, so this poster was made um, to educate the public on the nesting cycle and also to explain why portions of the area are closed off at certain points of the year. And one thing that I really loved about making this piece is that I had a lot of creative freedom with the style. Uh, and I was inspired by the look of National Parks posters. Uh, and something that we talk about uh, in the program with our instructors is that sometimes you don't always need to use a super realistic style to uh, get your educational message across. So if it's appropriate to do so, sometimes it's fun to try a new style or something that's uh, a little less realistic. Uh, and just really briefly about my background and how I got into medical illustration. Uh, I did my undergraduate degree in cognitive science at the University of British Columbia. Uh, and I did not know about the field of medical illustration until after I had graduated. Uh, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do after graduation. And I was sort of just searching online for jobs that combine art and science, which are two things that I love. Uh, and somehow I stumbled onto the Hopkins website for the program. Uh, and once I learned about it, I was like, oh, I think this is for me. So then I, I came back around to it and now I'm here. I wonder that I, my question is from the from the uh, projects that you do. Do you find that you, after researching uh, a subject matter, an animal, a part of the body, that you are now fall in love with that and 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 want to learn more about um, about it? I mean, how does it? How do these projects influence you personally? I feel like. That's been the case for me, especially doing a little bit more research, uh, like into the Eagles, for example. Um, there were so many things that I didn't know. And now I feel like I have a sort of a soft spot in my heart for them because they're such interesting creatures. And I'm also from the Pacific Northwest and we have tons of bald eagles over there. Uh, so I definitely do feel a bit more of a personal connection because I sort of spent so much time uh, looking into it. And I feel like most of the topics that are that we work on in our projects, they're all so interesting once you start researching into them. Uh, so I feel like, I, well, I don't want to speak for everyone, but I feel like most of us get like really invested in the projects that we're working on because there's always a cool angle uh, to learn about. 
And one thing that uh, our audience doesn't know about is that the students also have the responsibility of uh, doing a thesis in our program. So that gives them the opportunity to explore media much further, 3D modeling, and to take on a subject that is uh, managed uh, by a preceptor at Hopkins or somewhere else who is a, a, a specialist in that area. And they have to do all the writing and uh, bench work and research on that particular topic, and then come up with a novel way of expressing that uh, communication through a visual of some sort, an animation, uh, whatever it is that uh, is going to communicate the overall theme. Uh, that process takes on uh, takes is is presented in June of of the summertime after their first year, and uh, work begins on that uh, generally throughout the fall to some degree meeting with their preceptors and their faculty advisor, and then all the uh, bench work. Uh, has to be completed by the end of February, first part of March. Then they're doing all their writing, their materials and methods, creating all the artwork. Uh, and it has to be presented for acceptance uh, by the PhD master's committee uh, mid-March. So beyond doing co a coursework, they're doing thesis work as well in their second year. All right, let's move on to Sara. Hi, everyone. My name is Sara. Um, I'm 24, a little bit about, about me. I'm from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. I did my undergrad at Lehigh University. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Yeah, okay. Um, and I did double majors in behavioral neuroscience and art. And yeah, so I guess a little bit about my piece. This is uh, an illustration I made in our anatomical, our first anatomical class um, last semester. And I worked with um, an ENT surgeon to help him illustrate one of his procedures that involves removing cancerous lymph nodes from the neck. And so this illustration basically um, helps show the different regions um, by which the lymph nodes in the neck are divided, all the important nerves and muscles that are important to either protect um, or avoid during the surgery um, and how that lymph packet is then removed from the neck. And the purpose of this is to help him teach his residents how to perform the surgery. Um, and yeah, I made this using a combination of traditional and um, digital painting. So first I drew everything on paper um, and then I scanned it in all in different layers. Um, each of these structures were drawn on different pieces of paper and then I overlaid them and then finished painting it in Photoshop. Can you talk about the uh, conventional colors that are used, identifying colors for arteries, veins? Sure, yeah. So um, you can probably, if you've seen Previous the um, medical illustrations, you probably know that you know nerves are typically depicted as yellow, red for um, arteries, blue for veins. A lot of didactic color is used often in medical illustration. Things that are clearly identifiable um, and helpful for learning. So obviously, you know this is not what it would look like color-wise if you're opening up someone during the procedure, but for uh, effective learning. Um, and differentiating structures uh, visually, it's um, a very commonly used tool to kind of assign these bright colors. Um, and again, kind of going back to accessibility as well, it helps um, when viewing illustrations. If that answers your question. Yeah. Thank you. Let's move on to Anne. How does uh, do you, is it within the um, structure of the of the classwork? Do you go over the historic the history of scientific and medical illustration? Is that part of the learning process? Not so much, but we do have an archive. Of course, each of us as faculty members have all of our many years of you know production work 
at the ready for the students, but we do have an archive of Max Bradle's work, who started the program in 1911. He came to Baltimore from Leipzig in the mid 1890s and um, uh, the Mayo brothers wanted to hire him away. He was the medical illustrator for some of the top uh, 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 surgeons at that time at Hopkins. And so in order to keep him here in Baltimore, Henry Walters gave an endowment to the department, uh, you know, Henry Walters of the Walters Museum and uh, started the program in 1911. And what's very interesting is it was the first of its kind in the world, and from that our program emanated all the others moving forward uh, because of all the training that was done to those particular graduates and the spectacular art and, and anatomy that those first graduates were doing, and they went off to start their own uh, medical illustration programs across the country. So the archives in our department has all of Max's, uh, or primarily most of his sketches, but all of his pen and ink work. We're talking, you know, 1500 uh, pen and ink drawings and sketches that are all at, at the ready for students if they'd like to, to look at the work. And it is, I think it's kind of overseen by a faculty member, but they're, they have, you know, open reign to look at any piece that's in the collection. We've also gotten over the years other uh, archival material from other medical illustrators. And, and so we have uh, historically probably another five or seven very important medical illustrators in history of their work in the department as well. So we have, I believe we have Nick. Oh, I still have to oh, go. Sorry, Anne. We, we, we still have Anne, right? <laughs> sorry. No, no. Please. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. All of the presentations have been great so far, and I'm excited to be here. Share my screen. OK, so this was created for the same anatomical illustration course as some of the other pieces we looked at tonight. And mine focuses on exploring the anatomy of the optic nerve head or where the optic nerve enters the back of your eye, which is a very vulnerable space. So we also explored how that anatomy relates to glaucoma, which is a disease state that can cause blindness. So for the main image, uh, I illustrated some of the main vessels, nerves, and then structural support located in that area. And then I included some insets that provide additional information about the anatomy, like up here, just a little orientation of where we're at. And then these two insets here to further explain the glaucoma disease state and how that manifests in this area, including a little graphic depiction, sort of like a cartoon version of what's going on, just to really get the point across. And then for a little about me, before we open for questions. Um, I'm 22. I graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Madison with a degree in biochemistry. And uh, I'm really happy to be in this program and learning all that I am. It's really amazing. And did you have an art background? Uh, I drew a lot for fun, and then I took a few courses when I was in undergrad, but, you know, my major was in science, so it was sort of like something I did for fun until it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully it's still fun. Yeah, definitely. Hey, Tim, how is the, um, I, I, is, uh, like chat GPT and AI, is that influencing anything that's going on in the field? Our association is having a conversation about that this summer. And so uh, to some degree it's migrating in and, and it, it can be of some assistance to uh, the research and the work and, and the workflow, but it's, uh, it's a little cumbersome in you know, what, it spits back in the way of grammar and images. And, you know, the problem with AI is that it's going across the web and stealing from anybody's artwork that's already there. 
And so it's compiling, it's gathering, it's scraping, it's putting all these things together uh, without, in a sense, copyright approval from the individual artists. So there is, uh, there's some things going on right now with the Copyright Office and how they're going to handle this situation. And it is, it's a, it's a, a cumbersome and, but interesting uh, moment in artistic and, and scientific life. All right, so I think uh, we'll move on to Nick. Hello, hi, share my screen. Um, can everybody see it? This is a piece I did for the aquarium assignment, um, as well as in conjunction with the Maryland Nature Conservancy around this tree, the Atlantic white cedar that they're reintroducing to in particular, uh, National Park called Nassauango Creek Preserve, but other national parks along um, the Atlantic coast. It used to be the main native species of tree in those areas, but it was logged into extinction and then replaced with um, a tree that's worse for the environment. So they're reversing that decision and they're reintroducing the species. And then beyond just doing some ID and showing it in its environment, um, as well as some of the symbiotic relationships it has and its role in the ecosystem. Um, I can zoom as well. It's meant to be a poster um, and uh, it's going to be printed so that it can be used as an education tool because tree planting goes on with local classrooms. Um, and so this is something that they use with kids to get them excited about planting trees. Can you tell us uh, about the process of integrating all of this information and all these uh, uh, sort of um, uh, conservation moments? Um, okay, um, so I worked with um, the, my contact at the aquarium was a guy named Scott Shadow and he ran the planting program and he could answer some of my questions, but then he roped in the woman who runs the Maryland Nature Conservancy, a woman named Dan Deborah Landau. And she answered all of my major questions about not, because I could not visit the park in person. They gave me about two dozen images that they had taken um, to promote the tree planting project. So it was mostly like people planting trees, but from those images, I could extrapolate like what the environment looked like. And they also directed me to the website for Nassauango Park. Um, but otherwise it was just at every step of the way, like showing them sketches and getting them to sign off on whether or not like, they agreed with the specifics of all the understory plants and the lighting um, and the different, yeah, just the bark texture. Um, I tried to run as many of my questions by them as I could. And then beyond that, I think people in previous uh, presentations have said that a lot of the aesthetic decisions we get to make for ourselves. So as far as like the overall layout, um, I got to decide on that and how I wanted to portray each of the elements. Um, but beforehand, we kind of came up with like a master list of like everything that was going to be in it. It's chewy. I mean, the whole thing is well laid out and there's so much information here that you just want to study it over and over again. So can you tell us a little bit about kind of the mechanics of putting all this together and making it visually pleasing? Um, Yes, I wish I had at my disposal some scans. I did a lot of sketching beforehand. Um, when given the topic assignment, uh, I filled out, I don't know, a dozen or so sketchbook pages, um, just trying to get a sense of like the things that were going to be in there. So maybe doing like little thumbnails of each of the flowers um, or the butterfly individually, and then doing different studies of the trees. And then doing thumbnails uh, about generally how I want all of that to fit together. And then I took those sketches and I scanned them and I just like collaged them pretty, um, pretty crudely in Photoshop. And then based on that, did a final thumbnail. And then based on that, redid the, the final after that. As far as it, the secret is like, it's dynamic, like it's in layers in Photoshop. This is probably like 60 or so layers. Um, and so 
if I want to, for example, make this cue card look like it's behind this leaf, like I can do that by physically making it below that in like a layer, a stack of layers. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, it was an organic process of like moving lots of things around until I was happy with them. Um, and of course, those at the Nature Conservancy and National Aquarium were happy with the results. And, and just to kind of uh, recap, you made all of these individual organisms uh, separately as assets so that you could uh, enlarge them, reduce them, place them, move them around. Is that correct? Yes. Um, the trick is making sure that they're all to the same, like, for example, because this, this is a third set to be like a 30 inch poster. This is probably a four or five inch butterfly. So the file is four or five inches at the same resolution. So when you bring these things in, like the line work isn't like it's from a different file or done in a completely different environment. Uh, I can zoom in on this. I did some of the work in Procreate on the iPad. Uh, that's but honestly, this is all done in Photoshop. Um, yeah, I mean, all of the sketches, none of that's present in the final. It was just used to inform this process. And then it was mostly just having fun trying to fill it and populate it with as many different things that would be, in fact, in that space without getting distracting. Um, yeah. Any questions for Nick? Pam asked, how long did it take you? <laughs> as long as it takes. I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was not happy with the way it looked after it was due. It's not that the due date was like some hard, it was just like when we had to move on to a different assignment. After it was due, I spent some time correcting things that I didn't like about the original. So I probably went over the normal amount of time that one would spend on this assignment. I just, yeah. I, well, guesstimate I, the hours for us, Nick. I don't know. <laughs> From planning to finish, probably like 50. I mean, that's probably conservative. Like 50 hours. I was going to say that's conservative, that's conservative, probably. at 50. Probably like 20 hours of sketching. And then probably like I don't know. I don't know. I'm making a number out of 70, 80 hours. Um, a lot of those final hours aren't spent making edits. It's staring at it for like 30 minutes and being like, aha, there's this one other thing that bothers me. So, I mean, yeah, it kind of near the end, like you're not really making high impact decisions. Um, but I think we often tell the students that at some point, just put it away for a little while. And come back to it and then you know maybe turn it upside down or or you know just uh not be so buried in it that you kind of lose yourself and it's those aha moments when you've been away from it for a little while and come back to it that things begin to make good sense but you pulled this together really very well very well with a lot of information i'm sure they were very happy to have Well, I think that was our last student. If anybody has any comments, questions, we're still here or if people have to go, it's, uh, you know, we're, we want to have a conversation with you and, and uh, we were so happy to be a part of this this evening. Well, thank you, Tim. And thank you to all of the students for sharing <clears throat> their work, their, um, uh, their inspirations and, um, and giving uh, us can I time. ask a question before we're done? Sure. Go ahead. Um, thank you, everybody, for sharing your work. Really excellent. Re uh, uh, just excellent to look at. Um, we came by to visit the program a few months ago. Um, I am a patient at Hopkins also. When we saw a big postcard for the anaplastology, I think, in the spine doctor's office, um, and was really interested. Um, came by to visit and very Im impressive um, work that everyone was making. Um, I uh, myself have a background. Uh, my degree is in painting and 3D um, studio arts from here in MICA. Um, I was wondering if you have any of the students here, any of your students in the program, um, have 
a degree in studio arts where I studied that as a focus. It seems like everybody has a background. I did. I did. I went to art school. I'm, I went, I did the whole art route. A lot of my friends went to Micah, um, but I went to Pratt, but they're all the same. Oh, I have a um, lot of friends who went to Pratt. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's how it works. They're all, it's like pick your city that you want to live in for four years. I want years to apply like to the program and I'm trying to put together like a pathway to get there. Um, so, I mean, I would love to get any input on how you accomplish that. I went to UMBC and I did all of the pre-med classes there over three semesters. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, it was about all told 10 or 11 classes I needed to take in order to qualify. Um, and I did that while I was working. Um, it, yeah, it was stressful and, um, it's weird to be back. I was like the oldest person, not by a huge amount, but like I was older than all the undergrads and oh, I'm sure a little... I graduated in 2000. So I would be, also... but, um, I will say like UMBC was really accessible to, if you're here in Maryland and, um, the facilities are great and the faculty was really like helpful. Um, it was like an easy experience. How did you put together the your course um, selection? Did anybody at admissions or anybody in the program there help you select the courses that you needed? Yeah, so you are technically a non-degree seeking student unless you want to enroll full time for another, which makes no sense. But if you're a non-degree seeking student, then you have access to a count like a counselor. Um, but basically, the counselor was there to just like approve the list of classes I already knew I had to take. I went to Hopkins website and for the prerequisites, they have listed out like all the classes that they expect you to take. And I just took that list and went to UNBC and was like, okay, well, I want to go to this program and I need to take all these classes. So, and when one of the classes didn't fit in the schedule, they worked with me to figure out how I took it online through, they partnered with UC Berkeley and I paid for one online class and did cell biology through them. Um, yeah. I, they are ha happy to help you, it, especially like if you already have this pre, because most of the time they're coming with students, it's like, what's your career goal? And they have none because they're an undergrad. So you're like, no, I'm going to go in and I'm going to get out and I'm going to do these 10 classes and then I'm off to the races. So like they're happy to help. I didn't have any issues. Oh, that is excellent to know. Uh, thank you for sharing. All right. Um, we had a, Doris asked, does the program provide scholarship or stipend or does it charge tuition? There is tuition, but there is also scholarship available. Uh, we do encourage our students to find other funding, and um, but there is some scholarship available through the, through the department. And everybody is saying thank you, thank you, thank you in the chat box and, and uh, loving everybody's work and I concur. This has been phenomenal. Well, our students are fantastic. Uh, you know, as I say, I've been there a long time and, and I just to see how, how much they grow and how much they do and what they become. And I even learn a few things every year from all of my students. So it's, it's an education for me. So I'm happy to be with them. Do we have any other questions for Tim or the students? Otherwise, we'll say good night. Thank you very much, everybody. everybody. Thank you and stay well, stay curious, stay outside, stay creative. And um, Hopefully we'll see you next week on Must Learn Thursday, learning all about skunk cabbage. And we invite all the students to come back and learn about skunk cabbage because it's a fascinating subject, one that you might want to incorporate into a project. All right, everybody. Good night, everybody. Thank you.